In this second lecture of Less Than Nothing, we are starting the first chapter, which is the first of three chapters in Part 1, The Drink Before, and entitled Vacillating the Semblances. In Vacillating the Semblances, we are going to be focused mostly on what it means to think in a Platonic way in the 21st century. What did Plato say? What did Plato achieve in philosophy? that requires us to rehabilitate his thought in the 21st century. From this effort, we hope that we can make Plato come to life, and also identify some of the key philosophical movements that ground in their analysis an anti-Platonic dimension, so as to differentiate themselves from Plato. In that sense, we see that Plato has become both the footnote upon Western philosophy stands, and also the point of absolute negation around which contemporary philosophies attempt to form a t totally other identity. We will hopefully find that what is at stake when we think Plato today is nothing less than the status of how we conceive of truth, and whether or not we can still live up to the standards of a lived human mind that Plato set forth at the dawn of philosophical inquiry. It is from this perspective that Zizek starts his analysis in Vacillated Semblances, with the axiom that when truth is too traumatic to be confronted directly, it can only be accepted in the guise of a fiction. What Zizek attempts to convey in this notion is that Plato himself, the, ra the radicality of his thought, is too traumatic for the contemporary mind, and thus we can only confront Plato by reducing Plato to a straw man, to a philosopher of the highest fictional absurdity, the philosopher who proposed that we had direct access to the absolute truth. However, in classical Zizekian style, when we are thinking about the relation between truth and fiction, we have to think about their direct overlap. In this sense, we may remember that it is the Platonic philosophy, ultimately, that grounded the historical fictional movements of Western religion and philosophy, epur si muave, and yet it moves. As you can see here, we highlight the first chapter under part one of The Drink Before. In that sense, if you are still with me, you have enjoyed the call, and we are now at a bar having our first drink. In this chapter, we will see if our vacillated semblances find enough in each other to get a second drink. Zizek starts the analysis with the absolute basics, Plato and the status of appearances in relation to truth. In Standard Plato, which is often taught in introductory philosophy courses under the paradigm of the cave allegory, we have the standard distinction between relativistic temporal appearances of the world, the ever-changing dynamical manifold that manifests as a multiplicity of sensations, and the eternal reality of absolute truth, the never-changing, always-present, fundamental, unified real of being that can only be conceived by the most enlightened of minds. In Standard Plato, we are told that this fundamental unified real, this eternal absolute truth, is where we come from and where we will return. It is the eternal ideal, the realest possible being, and the true home of the soul. In that frame, the physical world is merely appearance. Merely there, a mute, indifferent background of appearance, the cave world of lower mind. Of course, on a meta level, when the human mind is told such ideas, like, for example, when the human mind first confronts these ideas in an introductory philosophy class on Plato, we are the actual recipients of logical propositions. In this sense, Zizek quotes the great 20th century philosopher of language, Ludwig Wittgenstein, in the relationship between language, reality, and logical form. Here's a quote from the Tracticus, 4.121. Propositions cannot represent logical form. It is mirrored in them. What finds its reflection in language, language cannot represent. What expresses itself in language, we cannot express by means of language. Propositions show the logical form of reality. They display it, end quote. What Wittgenstein means by this phrase 
is thus not that there exists an eternal absolute truth beyond the appearances in some naive externalist sense. Instead, what Wittgenstein is saying is that what the very logical form of a proposition in itself, the very symbolic reality of a proposition, displays itself purely in itself. In this sense, the fact that so many human minds have come to conceive of the logical form first convincingly articulated by Plato and instantiated as a part of our shared reality is the very way in which the absolute shines in our world of appearances. To push this idea further, Zizek deploys an unlikely connection between Wittgenstein's notion of logical propositions and Einstein's notion of space-time. In Einstein's theory of general relativity, as is common knowledge, he proposed the logical form that time itself is another dimension of space. In that sense, time becomes spatialized, and thus the past and future, as conceived by Newtonian physics, becomes eternally present. And thus it is only by virtue of the fact that our low-level mind or low-level perceptions of the world that we cannot conceive of the whole of time in its spatialized eternity. However, Zizek then paradoxically notes the necessity of this so-called lower-level mind state. For example, if we were all the time conceiving the whole of time at once, if we were in a state of absolute truth, then how could we practically engage in the world? In classical Zizekian form, he asks us to consider the most brutal and ethical situations, the traumas of being in an internment camp during the Holocaust, for example. Zizek claims that the price to be paid for the cognitive freedom of being in the absolute itself is that we become subject to the most devastating blind spot, quote, we can see everything except the present of the camp itself, end quote, and thus become unable to act ethically. Now here Zizek makes the crucial move to what he sees as a proper synthesis of the standard straw men of Plato. It is not that there is this dualism between temporal appearances and the eternal absolute, but rather that, in the flow of our becoming, in the world of temporal appearances, the eternal reality of an absolute surface, of a flow of sensations, shines through in the present moment. In that sense, Zizek here is instantiating a distinction that will be absolutely essential to understand for the rest of this episode and for the rest of the lecture series, that there is nothing beyond the appearances of becoming. There is only the temporal appearances where we experience the transpiration or transformation of absolute eternal states of being as a pure surface of becoming. Quote, Plato's deep insight, ideas are not the hidden reality beneath appearances. Ideas are nothing but the very form of appearance, this form as such, or the suprasensible is appearance as appearance. End quote. Thus, in Zizek's synthesis of standard Plato, we are asked to think of what we normally think about as the truth beyond appearances, as the very manifestation of the absolute truth within the world of appearances. In this positing, Zizek places great emphasis on the suprasensible. We can think of the supersensible almost as a sixth sense. We have the world as constituted by our sensations, sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell. But we also have the supersensible. Perhaps we could put on the visionary state, the state of pure manifestation of the idea as a surface image on the frontier of our becoming. The crucial thing to remember is that this appearance of the supersensible is conceived by Zizek as purely in itself, or as he states, supersensible is appearance as appearance. Building on the synthesis of Plato, we have Zizek attempting to make his first of many attempts to put Deleuze into conversation, first with Plato and then later with Hegel. It is a well-known fact of the history of philosophy that Deleuze was the archetypal anti-Platonic and anti-Hegelian thinker, the philosopher who attempted to think outside of the Platonic-Hegelian tradition. Here Zizek attempts to rethink both Plato and Deleuze as attempting to build a, quote, materialist truth. In this system, we have the dualistic structure of substantial bodies and a pure surface of sense. This could be thought of in contrast to the standard dualism of body and mind where we are constantly attempting to think, what is the connection between the body and the mind? 
is the mind in the brain, a biological body, or is the mind disconnected in a transcendental world soul above and beyond the world of appearances? In the system of substantial bodies plus pure surface of sense, we do not have to think in this particular dualism, and instead think about the way in which the pure surface of sense emerges from the realm of substantial embodied existence. Again, the pure surface of sense is nothing but appearance as appearance. Thus the mind is not reduced to the body, but it is also not transcendentalized in a realm beyond the world. In this analysis, Zizek makes reference to Deleuze's The Logic of Sense, where Deleuze begins by inverting Plato's eternal ideas and sensuous reality with the notion of senses as surfaces that subsist within being. Quoting Deleuze, Surfaces are not things or facts, but events. We cannot say that they exist, but rather that they subsist or inhere, having this minimum of being which is appropriate to that which is not a thing, a non-existing entity, unquote. Zizek furthermore attempts to connect this Deleuzean realm of pure surfaces against the transcendental substantial with the Stoics' first rejection of standard Plato in the notion of incorporeals. Quote, the Stoics were the first to reverse Platonism and to bring about a radical inversion. For if bodies with their states, qualities, and quantities assume all the characteristics of substance and cause, conversely, the characteristics of the idea are relegated to the other side, that is to this impassive extra being, which is sterile, inefficacious, and on the surface of things, the ideational or the incorporeal can no longer be anything other than an effect. End quote. In this way, Zizek claims that it is against this background that we should, quote, return to Plato. Here what he emphasizes, we gain from this return, is not that the eternal ideas are causing our lower realm of being, but that our empirical reality of appearances can and do participate in the eternal ideas. That an eternal idea can shine through it, appear in it. In this sense, Eternal ideas are not the ultimate cause, but an a-causal, outside of the normal chain of material cause and effect, a hole in the chain where the normal run of things gets de derailed in a discontinuous break. Here Zizek attempts to make a connection between Plato and the notion of attractors in complex mathematics. In complex mathematics, attractors are purely virtual forms, within a state space where all lines in a field point towards a form with no substance. Thus, the light at the end of the tunnel is not a fully substantial being, but a purely formal structure in a state space. We may say it is what emerges from the virtual tendency of a material body. Quote, One should fully accept that spatio-temporal material reality is all there is, that there is no other more true reality. The ontological status of ideas is of pure appearing. The supersensible idea does not dwell beyond appearances in a separate ontological sphere of fully constituted being. It is appearance as appearance. No wonder that the great admirers of Plato's Parmenides, Hegel and Lacan, both provide exactly the same formula of the truth of the Platonic supersensible idea, the supersensible. In this clear reaffirmation of how we are structuring this philosophical analysis, Zizek then attempts to ground what he refers to as raw Platonism, which may also be called a psychoanalytically informed Plato. In the dualism of bodies and the pure surface of sense, we do not just have bodies in the world, but bodies captured by fields of virtual force and attractors that become more real than the mere material reality. In that sense, Zizek starts to infuse his Platonic synthesis with language that will be common to anyone who has read Lacan we have the introduction of a real that is deeply embedded in material reality, something that emerges within material reality as its imminent tendency despite appearances towards decay. From that perspective, when we see that all material things fall into disorder, when we find that all material things eventually fall to universal laws of entropy, in short, when we see that things fall apart, we may think that this is really the lower level realm of being, that in fact, the revenge of Plato is that what is imminent is the idea, 
the idea in its virtuality as a whole in being, that pulls all material bodies towards its ideal perfection. We can thus think of our material bodily becoming, with a surface of sense, as lines of force that is the very surface structure of our becoming, where we reshape our bodies in relation to the idea. Quote, the real announces itself in the seductive appearance of a naked body, in the spectral appearance of the naked body, that is to say, in the opposition between the spectral appearance of the sexualized body and the repulsive body in decay, it is the spectral appearance which is the real, while the decaying body is merely reality, that to which we take recourse in order to avoid the deadly fascination of the real as it threatens to draw us into the vortex of jouissance, or enjoyment. Here this virtual Plato is also used to structure the realm of analysis on the political level of ideality. For Zizek the true event of modern politics can be captured by the event of the French Revolution, where, quoting Kant, the hitherto unthinkable happened, a whole people fearlessly asserted their freedom and equality, end quote. The fact that this event restructured not just France, not just Europe, but world history, was for the German idealist evidence that it was the emergence of an eternal idea that offered the real possibility of freedom. The problem for the German idealist was how to think this break with traditional structure, how to think a world constituting itself in relation to absolute freedom from external forces. Thus, what was absolute about the appearing of this idea in world history was that it was the highest expression that human beings, our material bodies seen from the outside, no longer ran along deterministic trajectories posited externally by monarchical forces, but in an eruption from within, asserted new trajectories, posited new, de new destinies, and became the active participants in a new world order that would rediscover value structures in free transformations. Thus it was the main claim of the German idealists that history was not just about material progress of industrial advance in their time, or informational advance in our time, but also of freedom, of the ability to determine your own trajectory in the world. In order to think this event today, Zizek attempts to make connections between the discontinuous nature of evental ruptures with our current world where people fearlessly assert new trajectories on the collective or individual level, in ways that cannot be predicted in advance, in ways that cannot be predicted by expert opinion. From this perspective, when it looks like there is no way to escape, when it looks like the coordinates of our being are surrounded on all sides by impossible obstacles, it is precisely in this time when we should expect the impossible to happen, when all of a sudden the coordinates of our being change, and what was once impossible becomes an imminent actuality. Zizek structures the real of such events with analogies to the event of falling in love. When we fall in love, the normal routines of our lives become background noise. The normal routines of our lives become performed in indifferent mechanical ways, simply because everything pales in comparison to the passionate attachment of our newfound love. In that sense, there is a suspension of the normal run of events, as if it loses its real, and a new real that is impossible to ignore overdetermines the coordinates of our being. Quote, for an authentic political engagement, an absolute intervenes and derails the normal run of affairs. It is not so much that the standard hierarchy of values is inverted, but, more radically, that another dimension enters the scene, a different level of being. For Kant, is there true progress towards freedom in history? Kant thought that although progress cannot be proven, we can discern signs which indicate that it is possible. Kant interpreted the French Revolution as such a sign, which pointed towards the possibility of freedom. The unthinkable happened, a whole people fearlessly asserted their freedom and equality. Here we can move to what Zizek sees as the 20th century constellation of philosophy, a constellation that he constructs in relation to Badu's assertion that the 20th century was the anti-Platonist century where all of the bad things in the world were blamed on the Western tradition which adheres to Platonic thinking of absolute truths. The first element of the constellation, we have the vitalist school, 
with thinkers such as Nietzsche, Bergson, and Deleuze. In the Vitalist School, what we have emphasized is the real of a life becoming, of a life flux. In this school, Nietzsche, of course, emphasized the will to power of a radically engaged subjectivity that was free from any external tyranny like the church. Bergson emphasized that constant change and novelty that was a part of the new scientific evolutionary worldview, where we could no longer think in terms of a dead materiality, but had to think the radicality of the living being. And Deleuze emphasized becoming and multiplicity over any notions of a static being or a real oneness. Thus his whole metaphysics was an anti-Plato on the highest sense, where we conceive of an eternal one. In the empirical analytic schools of philosophy, we have the conjecture that we should only focus on things that we can empirically observe in the world, and we should not waste our time thinking about transcendentals or abstract concepts like freedom and truth. We should, we should instead ground ourselves concretely in the world and disconnect as much as possible from the crazy realm of ideas. Thus, this school privileges a more reductionist and analytical frame of mind that wants to get to the core of mechanics and the core workings of a phenomena independent of the mysteries of their framing or their relation to the mysteries of the totality of being. It is not that the empirical analytic school does not think such questions are important, but it does not believe we can make progress on these, on these ideas by way of recourse to more idealist philosophy. In the Marxist schools of philosophy, we also have a political rebellion against Platonic notions of idealism because we have the introduction of a materialist dialectics that is skeptical of all spiritualism and religious thinking that would take us away from the practical life workings of the proletariat working class and their material instantiation in being. Thus, for the Marxist schools, what we are aiming at is a materialist theory of history that can explain how we can go from primitive communism to a world communism that is pure in its material instantiation. For Marxist philosophers, Plato is often seen as too much in the clouds. Moving on, the existentialist philosophers. We have many thinkers from Kierkegaard to Husserl to Sartre who assert that Plato eradicated the multiplicity of existential modes by asserting the singularity of being. Thus, the singular uniqueness of a life world, its singular existence irreducible to an overarching truth, is what most fundamentally characterizes this form of philosophy. For existentialists, we would be better to focus on the pureness of existence in itself, where we are phenomenally grounded in the real of our birth, the real of our growth, and the real of our attempt to make sense of mortality and finitude. Here, one of the principal axioms of existentialism were proposed by Kierkegaard's Socrates versus Christ, and in Sartre's Existence Precedes Essence. Now on to Heidegger, who stands as one of the most titanic figures of 20th century Western philosophy, with his masterwork Being and Time. In Heidegger's work, we have an anti-Platonism that negates Plato as the founder of Western metaphysics, which instantiates the ultimate delusion of the historical process, causing us to forget being itself. Thus for Heidegger, with the existentialists, he would call us to affirm the real of being over the idea, and that if we are to start and ground ourselves in being, we would be able to better understand existence and the world than if we are lost in the realm of ideas. Finally, in democratic anti-Platonism, Zizek attributes this school of thought to be championed by Karl Popper and Hannah Arendt, who believe that Plato is the reason for Western thinking of a closed society that tends towards totalitarianism. In this assertion, Plato is seen as a figure who subordinates the real of political decision-making to the realm of absolute truth that can be accessed by the greatest philosophical thinkers and thus disconnected from the masses and disconnected from a realm of ethos of democracy. For democratic materialists, we should always emphasize the contingency of unpredictable political decisions that cannot be contained by an a priori truth. What Zizek ultimately ends with here is a meditation on the fact that Plato, like other philosophers, most notably Descartes and Hegel, 
become negative points of reference in the 20th century, where their names are used as a signifier to launch a new philosophical project that could break from tradition. Of course, for Descartes, he is often used as a negative point of reference for naive mind-body substantial dualism, where mind is reified as a substantial essence, and where Hegel is often used as a negative point of reference for naive notions of absolute knowledge at the end of history, where the Hegelian dialectics can bring us to a true conception of totality. In this analysis, we try to situate why Plato should be worth repeating, even against the philosophical onslaught of the 20th century, which seeks to relegate Plato to an old, ancient tradition that is not worth rethinking. We can build from what we started building at the start of the lecture, namely that we, what, what we affirm is the distinction between material bodies and sensual appearances. What the contemporary philosophical world will affirm is that this dualism includes bodies and languages. As in the first quote by Wittgenstein on the nature of a linguistic proposition, revealing the logical form of a truth. In this sense, the return to Plato is a return to the real of a truth. This is not a truth in the sense of a totalizing sphere independent of being and existing from all time, but it is the real of a truth that shines forth to an individuated material body on the plane of sensual reality as an event signaling an absolute rupture. The point of reaffirming the real of truth is to return to the level of a subject as a being that structures its world in relation to the highest cause it can conceive, i.e. the reason or the art of its being. In a paraphrased pas passage from Badu, human reason cannot be reduced to the result of evolutionary adaptation. Art is not just a heightened procedure for producing sensual pleasure, but a medium of truth, and so on. This is where Zizek, following Badu, situates the difference between democratic materialism and dialectical materialism. For Zizek, democratic materialism seeks to reduce our life to a play of bodies and language games, with no truth that structures or orients our being, with no truth that can signal our direction in the matrix of being. In contrast, dialectical materialism still seeks to make sense of truth, still seeks to make sense of what it means to be a linguistic body caught in a historical web of higher-level mystery and purpose, where the normal run of things can be derailed by an absolute that blinds us out of our mundane life worlds. Quote, There is nothing but bodies and language, to which materialist dialectics adds, with the exception of truths. How can a human animal forsake its animality and put its life in the service of a transcendental truth? How can the transubstantiation from the pleasure-oriented life of an individual to the life of a subject dedicated to a cause occur? How can one break out of the network of the causal connections of positive reality and conceive an act that begins by and in itself? Thus one can see why Zizek would be against the notion that our world is simply bodies and languages devoid of truth. In this conception, truth is the turning of a circle. The way in which a subject can, in and for itself, generate an act that overdetermines the coordinates of being itself. In that sense, the universality of being is structured in such a way that a particular element, a form of human subjectivity, can engage in a circular motion of self relation that allows it to restructure the very coordinates of being itself. Now let's try to do the hard work of a philosopher committed to Plato. Can we rethink Platonic truth in the 21st century? Here there is an ancient battle at work. This is an ancient battle that is still being reenacted today in our current symbolic universe between fundamentalist traditionalists and liberal progressivists. This is the difference between the closed universe of a totality of being, or God, and the self-referential abyss where there is nothing but bodies and languages, or void. In this structure today, we have seen that the origin of philosophy itself emerges in this battle. The origin of philosophy in this battle is a battle between two poles, the poles of a closed mythical universe and the self-referential abyss of the sophists. The concrete problem is the problem of whether or not our speech can find any true external support. 
This problem that emerges on the side of an antithesis, with the self-referential abyss of what Plato referred to as a horror vacui. In this sense, Plato was well aware of the old mythical closed universe, and he knew that it could not be saved in philosophy, and that the real problem was finding out how to re-anchor our being in a metaphysical realm of true ideas. From this works, which can be found in the Parmenides, we find a meditation of pure logic, the pure logic of the relation between being and one, or as we will soon find, the relation between what psychoanalysis thinks of as the relation between the real and the signifier. For now we can think of being and the one as a relation between the world and oneself. The starting point is the phenomenological fact that the human universe is not just a low-level concept of reality, something like we might think of in the scientific sense of the term reality. In the human universe, we must also think the fictional semblances, or the symbolic masks, that in many ways count much more than mere reality. Here Zizek invokes Lacan's formula for fiction versus reality, as the truth of a human universe where a mask means more than the reality beneath the mask, like when the symbolic title of father or mother becomes the reality of the empirical bearer of the title, which is, of course, just a material human who cannot in any way live up to this ideal title. From this view, we can actually rethink the old analogy of Plato's cave, not as a naive separation between appearances and true reality, but the truth of a perspectival distortion of being, that being appears to itself as a perspectival distortion. This is equated with the cave as sensation and the truth as a supersensible frame that is always already the condition of our becoming. The truth as a supersensible realm is thus not reality as it really is, or things as they really are, but the relation between supersensible semblances vacillated semblances, the gap or distance or antagonism between a field of vacillating semblances. Quote, In the history of philosophy, the first exemplary case of vacillating the semblances occurs in the second part of Plato's Parmenides, with the deployment of eight hypotheses on the relation between being and one. Each hypothesis, of course, describes the contours of a semblance. However, taken altogether, they are not mere semblances, but semblances vacillated. It is not the Hegelian dialectical process the climax of this strategy of vacillating the semblances. Each figure of consciousness, each notion, is described and denounced in its semblance, without any reliance on an external standard of truth. Here let's start the exercise that Plato started. In the Parmenides, we have is a matrix of all the ways in which these truths as semblances can relate to being. In this philosophy, we get a clear difference or a more sophisticated ar articulation of the closed universe of a fully substantial truth and sophistic language games universe in relation to a horror vacui. Zizek claims that this is achieved in some sense through the Socratic collapse of the Big Other, which introduces a movement into the ideas themselves, which introduces the philosophical dialectic. Because, of course, as is central for Zizek, the Big Other is fundamentally inconsistent, fundamentally incoherent, nothing but the realm of vacillated semblances. In this matrix, we have on one side the unconditional one proposed by Parmenides, as an unconditional, fully constituted ontological one. We have here the Parmenidean absolute being, the eternity of the moment of the eternal fullness of being. In this first gesture of philosophy as absolute being, we have the mother of all logical propositions. We have the highest possible logical proposition. And it is a logical proposition designed very specifically, designed as a way to keep away at all costs the horror vacui of non-being, the void, the nothingness. In existential terms, to vanquish death with God. In this way, we can conceptualize the birth of philosophy as the birth of the ultimate coincidentia appositorium, the ultimate structure of being and non-being, life 
and death, something and nothing. Now Plato approaches the matrix of the being and the one with eight different logical propositions to attempt to work out all of the possible relations between this coincidentia positorium of being and non-being in relation to the vacillated semblances of suprasensible frames of reference. In Baduian terms, we have the formal matrix of eight possible worlds with each hypothesis of a semblance formulating a world's imminent transcendental. In this matrix, Zizek emphasizes that the eight hypotheses are not a forerunner to the postmodern plurality of universes, where there is no one true reality, but rather the matrix of one imminent impossibility or deadlock, where the one and being appear as an asymmetrical relation that cannot be actualized as symmetrical, where one would overlap with being in eternity. In order to understand this matrix, let us first cover the hypotheses that posit that a positive result for the one is possible. A positive result for the one is in some sense its verification in existence as a really existing one. In hypothesis two, we can read the formula, if one is, then the consequences for the one is positive since the one is simply. However, in this situation, Zizek notes, that it is also paradoxically one of the strangest scenarios because if the one is, it is by definition different than being, since we find ourselves in the world that is not one. Here the one participates in being somehow, which is different than the one. In hypothesis three, we read the formula, if one is, then consequences for the others is also positive, since others can also be one with being. In this scenario, we have a one as a series of others. In hypothesis five, we read, if one is not, then the consequences for the one is still positive, because we are dealing with the one as a negative predicate. We are dealing with a one that is not. In hypothesis seven, we read, if one is not, then the consequences for the others is positive, because the one is a negative predicate and it functions also for the others. Now let us move to the negative results. In hypothesis one, we have, if there is one, then the consequences for the one is negative because we are dealing with a one that is ineffable to our knowledge, a one that exists somehow, but it is not accessible to us. In hypothesis four, we have, if there is one, then the consequences for the others is also negative because if the one is, but is ineffable in being, then this is also true for other beings. In hypothesis six, we have, if there is no one, then the consequences for the one is negative, because it is not a non-existent entity, as in the one is not, but a non-entity. There is nothing of a one. In hypothesis eight, we have, if there is no one, then the consequences for the others is also negative, since the one is a non-entity, also for the others. I will note here that if you want to stop and replay this part of the video, or if you want to follow along to this part of the video with the actual chart in less than nothing, one could find this representation along with Zizek's descriptions on pages 53 through 55. Quote, what if the matrix of all possible relations between the one and being is also effectively the matrix of all impossible relations between the signifier and the real? Socrates tries to resolve the paradox that opposites can be attributed to the same entity, oneness and multiplicity, rest and movement, etc., by way of distinguishing between the eternal order of ideas and empirical reality. The entire set of hypotheses in Parmenides has a formal matrix of eight possible worlds, each hypothesis formulates a world's imminent transcendental. The eight worlds implied by the eight hypotheses arise against the background of a certain impossibility or deadlock which generates them, the impossibility of reconciling being and the one, the real and the signifier, of making them overlap symmetrically. There are many worlds because being cannot be one, because a gap persists between the two. Thus, if we take the Parmenidean logical exercise by Plato between one and being as something designated 
to be rearticulated in the modern world, then we can here engage with psychoanalysis and the potential overlap between the philosophical notion of one and being with the psychoanalytic notion of the signifier and the real. The wager here is that this relation between a one, a signifier self, and being, a world real, emerges precisely because of an asymmetry that constitutes the relation, an asymmetry which is attempting to be reconciled, or which is imminent in its impossibility of reconciliation, on the side of the one or the signifier. What this means is that being or the real is not in need of reconciliation, it is just there, but it is in fact on the side of the one or the signifier, where the demand for a reconciliation appears, as in Parmenides' initial desire to reconcile being with an absolute being or a one. Here Parmenides is the ultimate one, the ultimate signifier, attempting to reconcile the material asymmetry with an ideality. What does psychoanalysis teach us about this relation? Zizek helps us to recall that it was Lacan who noticed that the formula there is a one, but that in fact this one is something like a minimal partial object, what Lacan referred to as the object petit a, as the paradoxical placeholder that emerges as a virtuality representing the absolute unity of opposites. In this way, the one is constitutive of the death drive, and that even the one is an emergence, an emergence from a preevental oneless multiplicity. What does this tell us about being? What does this tell us about the real? Or more precisely, what does this tell us about the relationship between one and being and the signifier and the real? If one recalls the first lecture, we can here make a clear connection between Plato, Hegel, and now Lacan. In that sense, there is no one in a negative sense. There is only the pre-evental multiplicity. However, with the introduction of the one in the philosophical sense, or the introduction of the signifier in the psychoanalytic sense, the pre-evental multiplicity is transformed into the one is not, in the paradoxical sense that the one or the signifier appear to themselves as a supersensible semblance. From this perspective, the one or the signifier are irreducibly barred internally, not externally. There is no final reconciliation or final truth. There is nothing but their imminent deadlock or impossibility, internal to their very ideal structure. The only eternity is the asymmetrical void where images of the ideal appear to the one or the signifier, or where the one or the signifier themselves form. In this sense, let me emphasize that the formulas that were again emphasized in the first lectures, that the real difference that we are mediating in the human universe, the real truth that we are mediating dialectically, as opposed to simply being in a realm of bodies and languages, is the division between division and non-unity, or the real of the non-other. What this means is that internal to the subject-object division, i.e., there is another division. Now I am going to ask you to stop for a moment and reflect on this, because it requires extra attention. What does this mean? It means that you, as a subject, as a subject of the signifying chain, divided from the world, and thus gazing out at the world, there is another division. A division constitutive of the difference between you and the ideal of a perfect symmetry. This is what it means to think division between division and non-unity, or there is a non-other. We can think this formula as a potential hypothesis to contain all the other plurality of universes in the Parmenidean formulas, since we include within the hypotheses the situation for being, or the real, before the introduction of the one, or the signifier. And then we also include the situation for the being, or the real, after the introduction of the one, or the signifier, which by definition appears to itself as a supersensible realm in itself, which is marked by its imminent antagonism or impossibility of being fully one, or being fully signifier. In that sense, we have a one that emerges and we have a one that is internally thwarted from being one. We have a not one, or a non-other. Furthermore, according to Lacanian psychoanalysis, we can identify that this not one, or non-other, is constitutive of a multiplicity of libidinal drives, as repetitive ticks, a multiplicity of worlds dialectically constituting themselves, vacillating semblances, whose 
imminent transcendental is marked by a relationship to the one, i.e., how a vacillated semblance attempts to eternally resolve the deadlocks of its non-being or non-unity. Now then, let us go into the paradoxical realm, this paradoxical realm between the two, between the one and being, and between the signifier and the real. This is the paradoxical realm precisely because it is something not accounted for in traditional ontological frames, which cannot think this imminent tension or antagonism. Here Zizek starts his analysis between the two with the archetypal materialist philosopher, Democritus. In Democritus, materialist ontology, we start with the material realm of atoms and the void, which can be formulated as practical, the materialist approach to the same problem that Parmenides articulates on existential terms between being and non-being. However, what is often lost in simplistic scientific interpretations of Democritus, which outside of the realm of modern quantum field theory, are usually friendly to Democritus, is the idea of Den. Den was Democritus's name for the fact that we did not simply need to resolve the issue of atoms and the void, but the very emergence of atoms and the void and their movement. Atoms and the void are not static, reified things existing from all time, but a state of being that emerged and was in constant motion. In order to explore this motion, the notion of den is meant to capture the radical real of the void, the radical real of nothing. In that sense, we are not conceiving of the void in a naive sense of a pure nothing that exerts no no effects and no consequences on something, but as constitutive to the motion of something, as necessary for something to call something else into being. Like, for example, when Parmenides confronted the nothingness or the void and called into existence absolute being, as an image that ignites the ideational motion of philosophy itself. In this formula, Parmenides' absolute being, which is obviously a ridiculous image to guard against the nothingness of death, is not conceived on the level of something, but on the level of less than nothing, as the ultimate unity of the opposites, in the guise of Parmenides' object of desire. Thus philosophy, from a psychoanalytic point of view, has always carried with it a blind passenger, the less than nothing of virtuality that upholds any conjecture or positing of the state of being. As Zizek quotes from Barbara Cassin, Lacanian modification of Lacan himself, quote, not nothing, but less than nothing, end quote. In this sense, den is the name for a subtraction after negation. Quote, if for Parmenides only being is, for Democritus, nothing is as much as being. In order to get from nothing to something, we do not have to add something to the void. On the contrary, we have to subtract, take away something from nothing. Nothing is the generative void out of which O things, primordially contracted preontological entities, emerge. At this level, nothing is more than o-thing, negative is more than positive. Once we enter the ontologically fully constituted reality, however, the relationship is reversed. Something is more than nothing. In other words, nothing is purely negative, a privation of something. Quote, If we take the form of the one away from the others, we get a chaotic, unlimited multitude. If the one is not as full ontological reality, the space remains open for ones which just are, that is, for the fluid play of appearances in which others can partake of the one and thus acquire a temporary fragile consistency. If, however, there is no one, not even a temporary elusive appearance of oneness is possible, leaving just the void of nothingness. Here, from the last lines of Parmenides, then may we not sum up the argument in a word and say that, truly, if one is not, then nothing is. Certainly. Let us as much be said, and further let us affirm what seems to be the truth, that, whether one is or is not, one and the others, in relation to themselves and one another, all of them, in every way, are and are not. 
and appear to be and appear not to be. Most true. End quote. Could we get a better demonstration of vacillated semblances? Here we start with the world without any sign of a one, just a chaotic, unlimited multitude. Then we move to the space where there appears ones, where the one is not, as a full ontological reality. And this space persists as a space where ones appear to themselves, partaking in the one, but not able to be fully one. They appear and disappear as fragile, inconsistent semblances, vacillating in a historical void. However, as philosophically convincing as this ontology is, this work is not finished. History is not finished. We have paradoxes to work out, paradoxes that can be approached with what emerges in historical dialectics and paradoxes that can be approached with what emerges in psychoanalysis. In that sense, we should always emphasize the productivity of the void. In order to start with such a project, let us start with what, evolving from the Democritean version of materialism, we can call the materialist dialectic of historicity. This dialectics has four principal features that we can analyze in turn. The first is that our world appears to us as a holistic entity, as connected and integrated as a whole, where phenomena are co-determined by each other, where we can find no phenomena that are isolated and disconnected from the totality of being. The second feature is its evolutionary character, the fact that the whole is a state of constant movement and change, that there is nothing we can discern as static and immovable. In this sense, we have learned that being itself is an evolutionary phenomena, not merely in the sense that biology evolves, but that everything is evolving, changing from moment to moment, in a constant flux of becoming, at different scales and different velocities. The third feature is a consequence of evolution, that it is characterized by emergence, which is to say that there is not simply a drift in stable quantities, but instead an evolution where new qualities appear, phase transitions into new states of being. In this sense, being can transition from one state into another where the radic radically new as quality can appear in being. We can thus start to grasp the true temporality of being as manifesting what was once non-manifest. Fourth, this integrated evolutionary emergence does not happen without conflict and struggle. That being appears as a struggle of opposites, where oppositional determination allows for the emergence of the radically new. The old and the new are in a constant state of antagonism between something that is dying and something that is being born between something that is preserving itself and something that is constituting itself for the first time. Philosophy proper, as we have seen, is in some sense situated itself in the field of oppositional determination within a coincidentia oppositorium of being and non-being. How do we then make sense of this dualistic or oppositional character to the becoming of being? Should we, on the one side, take a good pole against a bad pole, as in Parmenidean's initial philosophical gesture, where he asserts the primacy of absolute being against its opposite absolute nothing? Or should we take a higher, deeper view and search for a metasynthesis of opposites, where we see that both are in some sense necessary for the appearance of being, as in the Socratic-Platonic dialogues that wrestle dialectically with being and non-being? In the language of modern quantum physics, a both-and situation. Here, Hegel stays with a classical either-or, but does not, against common wisdom of the Hegelian dialectic, offer a metasynthesis that both are necessary, even though, of course, both are necessary. Instead, Hegel opts for a historically engaged approach where one asserts the new, but not in a naive progressivist sense where one posits the utopian image as in Parmenides' absolute being, eradicating its oppositional determination. Hegel opts for the new in a conservative stance, which acknowledges fully and absolutely that this new is inclusive of chaos and uncertainty, that there is no guarantee of success, that there is no guarantee that the new will be good, that there is no guarantee that the new will produce a utopian reconciliation of being. In this perspective, then, 
what becomes of Platonic truth in its radical Hegelian historicization. In the classical relation between the ideological inside versus the external outside, Hegel opts for neither. In history, it is not that there is an ideological inside versus an external outside. Instead, the point is that the internal inconsistency and incoherence of an engaged, vacillated semblance, the ideological inside, or subjective suturing, allows for the very objectivization, or externalization, of the outside. In that sense, it is the very becoming of integrated semblances, vacillating in a void, that objectivizes reality itself. In that sense, there is nothing but figures of consciousness, who are becoming what they are, and constituting truth itself in a play of their own symbolism, which is not a pure chaotic multiplicity, but a multiplicity against the background of the not one, their own imminent impossibility. Here, quote, Sophist broke down the mythical unity of words and things, playfully insisting on the gap that separates words from things and philosophy proper can only be understood as a reaction to this. As an attempt to close the gap, the sophists opened up, to provide a foundation of truth for words, to return to the mythics, but under new conditions of rationality. This is where one should locate Plato. He first tried to provide this foundation with his teachings on ideas. The line of philosophers who struggle against sophistic temptation ends with Hegel, the last philosopher, who in a way is also the ultimate sophist, embracing the self-referential play of the symbolic with no external support for its truth. For Hegel, there is truth, but it is imminent to the symbolic process. The truth is measured not by an external standard, but by the pragmatic contradiction, the inner inconsistency of the discursive process. The gap between the enunciated content and its position of enunciation. In this episode, we have tried to look as deeply as possible at the world of Plato. Here we started with thinking a new Plato against the background of the Deleuzian anti-Plato, where we synthesized the dualism of material appearances and absolute ideality. From this perspective, we approach the domain of supersensible as appearance qua appearance, while attempting to enact and embed the nature of supersensible in its ideality as a formal attractor, constituting the sexual and the political, its imminent tendency. We then considered how and why 20th century philosophy functioned as a rebellion from Plato, blaming Plato for all of our failures and problems in its vitalist, empirical, Marxist, existential, Heideggerian, and democratic forms. We then took a deep dive into the realm of Platonic logic, how Plato attempted to understand the possible logical relations between being and non-being in a formal matrix of possibilities that represented the imminent transcendentals of true semblances. This in turn led us to put Plato in conversation with the logic of psychoanalysis, and we identified that there was a logical overlap between one and being, and the signifier and the real. This overlap allowed us to posit a metasynthesis of the Parmenidean hypotheses which allowed us to introduce into these hypotheses the development of no one and ones and not one, that is the feature of the one. From this attempt, we move towards the ontology of Den, which allowed us to view Plato from the perspective of the historical deployment of a historically engaged truth with the Hegelian approach to the coincidentia appositorium. Thus, we conclude the second lecture on Less Than Nothing, which grounds Chapter 1, Vacillating Semblances, of Part 1, The Drink Before. I hope you found this video lecture to be useful complement to the reading of Less Than Nothing, with the necessary visual and auditory aids that may be necessary to fully comprehend the ontological opening that is absolutely crucial to understanding the rest of the book. If you did gain benefit from this works, and if it helped you with your own understanding of philosophy, and more importantly, helped you with a deeper understanding of yourself, then I would very much appreciate if you considered becoming a Patreon. Becoming a Patreon is as easy as donating even $1 a month, and this helps me to continue producing the highest level of philosophical discourse possible.
With that being said, I want to thank all of my Patreons. Without your support, I could not continue making these videos, and special thanks to my newest Patreon, Alex Last. Thanks again, and also thank you to everyone who is still watching and paying attention throughout this lecture.